Before you noticed the women's liberation movement, I guess, um, where were you politically? Where did you start from, I guess? I was in the Communist Party mm -hmm. and I lived in London, in London's East End, in what was at one time the borough of Stepney, mm -hmm. home of the Cable Street conflicts. Mm -hmm. And it was a borough where that had all of the, the great and sometimes desperate characteristics of the East End. Enormous poverty, enormous chutzpah, heroism, and busy politics, busy politics, with a very strong, radical Jewish presence. That has now completely changed. Tower Hamlets now has a very strong Asian presence. So it's always been a kind of locale mm -hmm. of migration. And I was active in the Communist Party there, which at the time, in the 1960s, had a certain presence that was associated with anti-fascism and people's collective memory of the 1930s and the attempts mm -hmm. of British fascists to march through this great homestead of Jewish people, and in particular, migrants who'd fled mm -hmm. from somewhere horrible to safety and that was enormously significant because of course it was about to make somewhere that had been safe terribly dangerous and it was that history that informed t politics in Tower Hamlets for several decades really until the 1970s when mm -hmm. the, the demographics changed and when all sorts of very important upheavals were happening in the left in Britain and the left internationally. And the yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a big shift politically, I think, in the way that politics is discussed. You mentioned the working class and that you remember the Communist Party. Class, in terms of the national media, seems to have gone completely off the agenda. When we talk about poverty or inequality, it's in those terms rather than actually... Yeah. It's very rare that you hear the words working class. Yeah. Class has really been abandoned by by the political parties that really ought to take responsibility for it, which are the parties of the left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people who hang on to class, mm -hmm. the conservatives who are very confident mm -hmm. about the way that they think about class interests and the way that they exercise those class interests and indeed mm -hmm. the way they perform them. Mm -hmm. They have no shame. Whereas the Labour Party particularly in the, the era of New Labour um, burned class out of its consciousness. Of mm -hmm. course, class lives on and popular working class politics, no, that's wrong, popular working class cultures mm -hmm. still thrive and they thrive at the level of popular culture and mm -hmm. they thrive at the level of, um, I suppose, people's sense of what makes the world go round and who gets what but it doesn't find any articulation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the level of parliamentary politics really any longer. I'm thinking as well though that there's, it has kind of trickled down perhaps into the rest of culture. So trade unionism is at a historically low membership level for instance. Um, and it is quite difficult I think to talk to people about the working class being the class that produces everything useful. Well it is and of course part of the problem derives from the way that class was conceived mm -hmm. in Britain up until probably the end of the 70s when such a large swathe of manufacturing which was felt to be the kind of staple of working class productive life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was just wiped out. I myself think that class was always limited as the vector through which to think about progressive politics. And part of the problem with English radicalism, mm -hmm. I think, is that it was anchored in a, a limited sensibility around class. A working class man with a cloth cap, with his own house that he aspired to have, his own car that he aspired to have, his own wife that he aspired to have. It was not uh, a class culture that readily proffered a woman with multiple responsibilities who might perhaps be black mm -hmm. as a model, an iconic mm 
image of what it means to be working class. So that, that association between white, organised, respectable working class men mm. was a limit and, and it, in that limit really compromised the way in which labour politics in Britain were exercised because it was about the interests of primarily men and what they had in their hot little hands. It wasn't, it wasn't optimistically about how do you run a society that is democratic in all its dimensions, democratic in its personal relationships, democratic in the relationships between, uh, between cities, between different mm -hmm. communities that live in cities. That's been an enormous struggle in Britain. And in the, the paradox, I think, is that in some ways it's a hugely successful enterprise. We live in a city, London, mm -hmm. which is probably one of the most complicatedly cosmopolitan in the world. You sit on a bus in London and you sit with the world. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, the interesting things about the trade union movement in particular is how conservative it has been at certain times, particularly during the post-war uh, full employment, there was um, the trade union movement was clearly a, a very good thing, a very you know a very of useful course, thing for, 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 for people. But it also had, you know, it was full of racism, it was full of sexism, it was going to go about things in a particular way. Um, but the whole history of the last two hundred years is the way that capitalism has changed, and there have been kind of big breaks. So trade unionism at one time was associated with mill workers, and then the match girls came along. And you have twelve-year-old girls going on strike. Some of the least organisable people in the in the country at the end well, of the nineteenth century. Well, it was assumed. It was assumed some of yeah. the least organisable, but of course they're no and then they more or less organisable than anybody else. So and their vulnerability and the vulnerability of groups deemed vulnerable within the popular classes, let's say within the working class, I think is less to do with are they difficult to organise? Are they difficult to reach? More a question of. What mediates our relationship to them? What gets in between mm -hmm, mm -hmm. them and a relationship to politics? Them and finding a voice, finding a presence. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is, there's an awful lot of crap gets in between mm -hmm. them and a sense that they can speak to and into the society that they actually live in. That's mm -hmm. what the problem is, has always been the problem. And that's a problem of the way in which, and it, this is not unique to Britain, it's a problem across the world, the way in which democratic politics historically have emerged, first of all in the interests of what we can still call the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. against vested interests, and then step by step the, uh, the interest of other constituencies within other classes, primarily first of course men. Mm -hmm. who claimed uh, to speak for everybody and particularly white men who claimed to speak for everybody and everybody who they didn't speak for wasn't worth speaking for. So it's been a huge struggle for those of us who are not white men mm -hmm. to find a place in the political conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that difficulty actually doesn't get a lot better. We think the House of Commons. It's never been more than, you know, an, an inch more than 20% women. Mm -hmm. It's madness. It's horrible. Mm 